So, oh, hey, right. tying in sustainability, environment, all is trying to be good stewards. What helps the environment better than honeybees? So, listen, everybody tells me this. This is so, I'm not saying it's Vogue, but everybody's into the honeys and the bees. Like, no booms, daughter. Like, <laughs> do, everyone I talk to has, like, yeah, dude, I keep a, like, we have a ranch. Like, Overwatch Ranch is really one of the guys on our team, one of the founders. His family has, like, 400 acres out mm -hmm. in, uh. Hebronville, yep. I don't know. Yep, yep. Anyways, um, oh yeah, I've I've had meat processed there. So mm -hmm. uh, it's a great place to go shoot stuff, right? Yeah. And um, close to the border. And he's always trying to. F <laughs> yes, there's issues with that. Um, but <laughs> he's tried to figure out many ways. You know, we're gonna put buffalo on that land, or we're gonna you know put bees <laughs> on it, or you know things like that. And there are so many ways to get into it. But it sounds like you've yeah, taken it to another know. level. I, what have you done? I, I, Obviously, I love this topic because um, it does come up a lot, uh, and there is a story, and I will share. Is this it a side hobby? Is this your? Is this no, 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 passion? no, no. So I'll give you some context here. Um, my father was a third generation beekeeper. Mm. Okay, so it, I, I this wasn't I started on my own here, and uh, he was a German. He uh, actually. He moved to Honduras, right? The whole going to Honduras was to be able to produce wildflower honey, tropical flower. No honey. kidding. So he went there and to breed bees it, like that, okay? And export it to to Germany, right? And and to Europe, but primarily Germany. So was um, it bomb? It, <laughs> It's wild tropical honey. I mean, listen to that. Like, How do we get just, hands on I this? Mean, I gave listen you some to coffee. This. I know. Yeah. I, What's happening? And uh, so she only has like a thousand hives. So no, know, I. I <laughs> <laughs> so um, you know, we actually came to the U.S. because of the Africanized bees that came through Central America that pushed my father and my family uh, to move north, right? And so because they were just invasive. Were they yeah, overtaking? they they killed off all the quote unquote honeybees, right? And so it I mean, you went from being a very large producer, wholesale producer of honey, um, and you've got then overnight your entire bee colonies are dead, right? Damn. And so Is that what yeah, oh I have so many stories about this. But but it's super impactful. Like, I mean, bees just coming into, you know, trying to get into the house when they were upset. And I mean did, okay, I remember so did you get did you get um, oh, stung a lot as a kid? Plenty of stings, right? And so but so my father moved, you know, to Texas <clears throat> because of that and and sort of looking for the colder winters that prevented the Africanized bees oh, from permanently staying in Texas, right? Hmm. And so, um, but over the years, right, I mean, beekeeping is such a key part of agriculture and everything. People don't realize that. Yeah. They have no so idea how important it is. My brother, um, <clears throat> my brother decided to go back when he was fairly young and restart the oh, beekeeping awesome. in Honduras because of my father. And uh, he's super successful. But at the time, it was how to work with Africanized bees, right? You have mm. these these tame, you know, honeybees, primarily European bees. And then you had these strong, aggressive, you know, killer bees, right? And uh, and But they were extremely hardworking. So there was, a, like, the bees themselves. So mm -hmm. how do you work with these two? And uh, so the only way to do it, when my brother figured out, and he then worked with other local beekeepers to try to adopt this approach, was you would change the queen bee from the hive uh, from a Africanized hive because you couldn't you couldn't fight the Africanization of the bees. So you would change the the queen bee with a European or a Russian queen bee that were being created here uh, in the U.S. and there was no. Other, you know, there's no they way to right. that queen. So what, 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 what we did was, mm. um, I would buy these queen bees here in the U.S. and um, for my brother, and they would arrive at the house in this like small little wooden box with like imagine a little mosquito mesh on top, right? And it had like a little compartment of food in there, and there's this like super expensive queen bee. I mean. You know, at the time, we were both young, right? And uh, and my father passed away when we were young. And so um, this queen bee was like maybe $800, $1,500, $2,000. How like, fragile that bee yeah. is. Yeah. And here's my mm. responsibility to take this bee from the U.S. to Honduras. Because it's not like I wanted to bring it, like, you know, without declaring it. There's just no legal process to do it. So what I would do um, is I would take this little box 
this little wooden box with a mesh and and a queen bee can never travel alone like she needs to be fanned by the worker bees uh combed if she's stressed out like they're there for 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 support right and so this little box had the queen bee and maybe five worker bees and so this little box buzzes like as you just hear the buzzing of the bees, like bzz, you know, just right there. And TSA has no problem with that. So, uh, <laughs> so how do you get it past mm. TSA, yeah. right? Like, how do you do that? And so I would have to find a way. And I'm like, well, okay, like I'm just going to put this right here where no one can see it, right? And but I could hear them. Like it's in my shirt. Like I can hear the buzzing, right? But no one else can. But I can hear it. So I'm constantly like just, oh, man, I hope none of them take out a stinger or something. That's crazy. And over years, I helped my brother by bringing these queen bees so to wait, balance out. So were you always out. successful or did you ever get busted? Uh, no. Well, I got stung many times. Oh. Yeah, I got stung. And I think the worst like, time. You'll never see you guys do that. Like, I'll put that between my. Uh, <laughs> I got this. Yeah, no, yeah. I think the worst time was actually going through immigration. That's commitment. And uh, and I'm getting stung, and I'm just like, oh god. <laughs> Her eyes are twitching. Yeah, like, right, oh, right. I'm just yeah. to things. <laughs> but I knew the importance oh of this god. queen bee for my brother too. So. Um, so you guys have good honey now. Yes. Uh, so, so my I've brother continues great. in the when business. When I come to Houston, I need some honey. Is yes, that, but I it's all honey. produced I in Honduras, and okay. so I bring it every time I go. Um, want to hear this? I grow coffee as that. well. Oh, here, I'll have some. You into this? I I'm done. Yeah. Are you done? No, you're not. Come on. Oh, come on, just a little tiny sip. Don't do that. Come on now. Wait, did it leave? Uh, hey, come listen. On. Oh, we can't mix it. That's right. Here. Listen, this is a fresh cup now. right here. It's my first rodeo. Come on now. <laughs> <sighs> this is done right. Yeah. All right. So this Thank is, you. what are these cups? Oh, really so nice. the place, yeah, where, 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 where we had all the scotch and stuff was um, the Mark. We had that private, we were the oh, first. Yeah, 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 a year yeah. ago? Yeah, I've been to, uh, that was, uh, the that was a cool lounge, place. Man. Yeah, that place Ooh. is cool. I've been there. Yeah, I spent some time there. But hold on, go Keep back to that. some cool stuff. So, the so honey. she's smuggling them in. All right, all right. So we've got the honey, right? I still, I, I, I will bring you amazing I tropical wildflower honey anytime like it my the brother still smuggler. produces really good the queen Dang. smuggler <laughs> right now she's gonna be arrested by time she gets home all right yeah i was like um, we might want to edit this part how, how do you get to the coffee part hey, what's though? the statue yeah what else do you grow what yeah, else do you, so, farmer hadessa yeah no 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 mm -hmm. so i mentioned that i i i mean i'm super passionate about being part of you know a greater good and helping the economy it. and so I kept going back to Honduras for many years and I couldn't just be a visitor. So I was like, all right, we have this beautiful land there and it's in the mountains. And uh, and I think I just fell in love with the idea of growing coffee. Like it's such a romantic thing to do. I mean, the, the, the bushes are beautiful. The berries are mm. bright red. You grow them underneath the trees by rivers. Like, how do you not I've like been. that? Have you been to Honduras? Never. No. <laughs> all right, so listen, there is... One of my favorite people in this industry is from there. So I'm going to really? introduce you to her. She's a savage. She, she's been in the industry and grew up with us for a long time. So she's babysat all of us throughout the years of our career, you know, running these conferences. And she's, um, I'll introduce you to her. She's, she'll be at DCAC every year. I look forward to she's it. She's really cool. If you guys come to Data Center World next week, are you guys coming in for that? Or are you guys? No. Jet no. Southern? Yeah. Got, got kids' yeah. graduation stuff coming up here. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I think I have that going on, too. Again, she'll yeah, be here at UT a... soon enough. So That'll be awesome. Well, listen, what's yeah. she going to study? Communications. Mm -hmm. well, PR I mean, communications. Maybe yeah. in the summertime, if she needs an internship or something, we we try to bring on college kids during the intern. Right on, man. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. We, uh, More we're More of that. us in the data center. We need uh, that. Absolutely. <laughs> 100%. Like, listen, uh, we're all about figuring out how to introduce this to so mm -hmm. many people. This is why we have the podcast, too, is because yeah. the conference, uh, you've been out of the game for a bit, but we started a conference a few years back, and and we have we were just trying to make a difference. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think there was a, 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 a lack of platforms to unleash some voices that just didn't have another place to go with yeah. ideas. So we, we started doing it, and then the big complaint was always, like, there's just – never enough so people wanted more conferences and and that just wasn't this is what we do on the side right so um and then i realized that i wanted to have i want to introduce the industry to as many people as i could we all have um things that are important to us like you have maybe honduras and you <laughs> have you know houston or texas you know texans are very very proud right and um i just had the military community right which is mm -hmm. where i come from that's where my whole yeah. lineage is from so I was like, I, I'm going to make sure I'm doing something that's very purpose-driven as well. And it has to dovetail back into that. So we started that conference. But really... Great show, by the way. 
Thanks, man. It, it this this I think this year should be something special. I'm really yeah. excited because I haven't really invested as much time as I'd like to into it because I was starting up another company, mm-hmm. and then finally I go to my I had I had a lot of there was pent up demand to sell it, so I was gonna just be like I'm washing my hands with this thing. I don't have the time. Yeah. I really owe it to my other people because that's part of my purpose and mission. And then, you know, the other people that are on my team are like, why don't we just buy it? And that way we keep it in the family. And I was like, I didn't think about that. You know, so. Yeah. I just didn't want to take anything away from what I'm doing on the Overwatch side, yeah. which is the primary of everything. It's just this allows me to get to military bases. Well, this allows me to get onto a post at it, you know Fort Hood, Camp Pendleton, Naval Station, San Diego, Norfolk, Virginia, over wherever, and and it also allows me to reach people that have been in this industry for about a whole year. And you remember the first time you got in this industry? Like it takes a year to learn the lexicon. Yeah. I mean, the exactly. whole language, yeah. like. There are, I'm not going to lie, I mean, there's plenty of times still to this day where people will use things, and I'm like, I'm not sure what that is. You know, I'm going to have to Google that, too. Yeah. I don't think it's really yeah. as much on the technology side, but uh, but there are certainly things on the mechanical permutation that is emerging. I'm like, they're just making up fucking words now. Right? <laughs> so, or it's acronyms, man. I mean, like, you get to where you know a language, and you just start spouting stuff on, and you think it's nomenclature, right? Like, that people would understand it, but it's like... No, nah, man, it's it's like exactly. It's well, it's if you a, it's a if you have the same language. dialect, we could speak shorthand, right? Right, right? But when you're around people that don't, we're talking, and it's remember for us, it was it might as well have been Mandarin right. Chinese, right? So absolutely, man. Those people that are going to be starting their careers that maybe aren't even sure if this is the right industry for them, I want them to hear your story. I want them to hear your story, and I want them to humanize those parts. One, they should understand who you are, so they could understand the credibility that comes in the information. Mm-hmm. If you guys are assigned to Intel. You know, uh, hold on, research, don't tell me, research, um, uh, strategy and execution, then they want to know where the basis of that comes from. And right. you guys all come from, and you've been in this industry for a long time. There should be some credibility with that. I think, though, that there's people that uh, have been here for a year, maybe two, and they're not really sure where they sit in the ecosystem yet, and they're not sure what they want to do, but they like the space or they have a purpose themselves. I need to get this message out to them too, right? So and the message needs to touch everybody because this industry will hold us up. And what I mean by that is every the capabilities and limitation of every industry. Think about the apps on your phone from e-commerce to banking to logistics and travel to whatever. If we don't have a solid solution for figuring out how to solve for more data centers at a higher volume and velocity – then we as the consumers will suffer because we won't be able to do the things that we want to do because the data centers are there to serve us right. through the cloud, through what, all these other things. But we're the ones that are the actual content creators. We're the ones that are uploading our videos and pictures and tweeting and doing our things, right? So, like, we need to be symbiotic. That's what the fifth generation – that's what the fifth industrial revolution is supposed to be about. We're in the fourth. Mm-hmm. That is about – how do we rotate? Obviously, we're over rotating right, right now on the, on the means and methods in which we adopt and use technology to where it does have an impact on the. I mean, someone was telling me, maybe it was on one of these podcasts, that um, the amount of time that like females can use on TikTok and the emotional chemistry that is created as a byproduct of that is almost the same as a teenage, a teenage girl doing that is almost the same as a teenage boy being on Pornhub. Mm-hmm. Right? And you're like, oof. You know, and I've, you know, Rogan's here in town. I see yeah. him all the time in stand-up comedy, and he he has a bit on that stuff that he's talking about how we do realize we're giving our people phones, and that's just access to unlimited everything on right. Earth. Right. right. How is this is a social? Well, experiment. as I said, it, it, there's there's great progress, and then there's <laughs> unintended consequences. But that's where you and rotate then, back. Yeah, you 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 have to adjust for the consequences yeah. that aren't um, because anything anytime you have change, normally, I mean, you know, it's kind of like a growth spurt if you're growing fat it hurts you know so it's like this is all part of the process and journey man. it's part of the process on the journey and it's like you got to think of where i i just kind of tie it back to the bigger picture right where it's like you know you get you get one life to live you get you know what kind of impact are you going to make you know what what do you want out of life right and what do you what do you want to lead right it's kind of like the old the um, legacy yeah. Well, you remember the old uh, you've seen Gladiator, right? Of course. When he uh, says, you know, what we do today, you know, echo, you know, echoes an eternity. Echoes an eternity, and yeah. it's like I, I, I'm a big believer. And then we talked about bees in the butterfly effect. I'm a huge believer in it. You go in in just the small things that you do, how you talk to a cashier, all of it matters. Everything matters that oh, you do. From a everything karma perspective, that you do matters because yeah. what you do here impacts how 
and you don't even know. Sometimes it creates big impacts. So it's like to me, it's like if you think about your interactions and you think about everything that it might be, your team building, you know, projects you decide to take or don't take, you know, all these decisions ultimately matter. And they and they and how you react to success, how you react to failure, how you react to everything in between, um, I think dictates things. And I and I and I what I like about being with good teams and being with people that you, you and that's part of why I why I have you know not buried myself into a job job um is you start having that flexibility to make those sort of decisions and who you want to work with whether that's You're more a of an colleague, entrepreneur, yeah whether it's a partner whether it's um a client you want to you love you the industry to, you want to enjoy what you're doing you want to enjoy what you do and you also want the flexibility to decide the sort of impacts you want to have, right? Because I love this. If you're drug into a situation that you don't feel good about, and you're doing it out of duty, and because of your, you know, it's an employment situation or whatever like that, it takes something from you that you you can't even you can't even um, equate. You can't you can't estimate even what that is. And uh, you know, yeah. Blake, who was a great mentor to me, um, dear friend, you know, he told me one time. He goes, Todd, you know, everybody talks about time, which is important. <laughs> it's finite. You only have so much. Yes. Hmm? We talk too much about it. Hmm. We know what it is. We know how much time is on a calendar. Hold what you second. don't cheers. know. Yeah, I was going to yeah, say. Cheers. cheers, cheers, cheers. I wanted to. Uh, yeah. This is yeah. uh, some new bourbon. Never tried it before. I'm trying it for the first time with you guys. This is all good, man. It's all good. So it's it's um it's a lot said, it's a lot different yeah. on that palate after you went through the other bourbon, huh? It's yeah, very especially different. since I switched to scotch for a second too. Did you really? You went yeah. bourbon, then scotch, then this. Uh, this is know. actually pretty smooth, man. I've never heard of it I'll before. I'll mix it up. Probably have a pina colada next to us. But um, I got some gin out there for you. It's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never touch it again. God, no, you gotta. Yeah, we're gonna have to find you some good gin, oh, buddy. Dude, I had J Bill Mazzetti and I sat here. You I had to throw out half the podcast. Oh, I had no, jazz no, hands no, ninety no. minutes into this thing. You need good gin. Um, let, let, let me say this. I have a couple questions because you you came on on two things. One, I want to talk about the data center joint task force, yeah, but yeah, I also please. want to talk about you 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 uh, touched on something that I was going to ask you. You know, none of us got to where we're at, you know, clearly on our own, right? There's a whole element in house, you know, in terms of in home, like personally that you have people that are worried about your faculty and capabilities and yeah. overall health. But then you have, there are three types of leaders, in my opinion. There's those that teach you how to do things right. There are those that teach you how to not do things because they lead in the wrong ways. And then there are those that kind of do both, right? Mm -hmm. Who are some of the mentors or leaders that you've had that have had the most impact? And it's, I'm not, we're not mm -hmm. 11 or 13. Don't tell me your favorite pizza or, you know, I mean, <laughs> I, it's hard. We're old enough yeah. to now be like, look, it depends. I've, you know, it depends on the mood or what day I'm at. I'm old enough now to be like, well, there's three things that are, there's three people in this industry that I could name right now that I wouldn't be here without, right? Are there people that have helped mold and shape your career? Are they people that you've had direct engagement with? Is this something that you were aware of someone or you read their writings that they inspired you to a call of action to create a mission or to join a movement or, like who are the people? Is it a? I mean, you were you guys were there in the early days, right? And there was a lot of energy that still existed when yeah. I got there. Like, look, I didn't do anything. I uh, underperformed when I was there, and it was because I wasn't there for the right reason and the right role, right? And and it was the right team. I wanted to be there with those people. I have great people, but I just wasn't doing what I should be doing. And when you're not, uh, if would you do things because you can, not because that's what you're really good at, then you're never going to be as great at. If you're doing things that you really enjoy doing, you'll be more inspired in how you do it. You feel safer doing it. You're more fulfilled with it. Mm -hmm. Your output and productivity is higher. But I was there for all the wrong reasons, right? And it was the greatest thing that happened to me. I've learned so much. But there was people there that still, in spite of that, I learned a lot from. I took advantage of the best situation of, of that situation, knowing that, like, man, one of my, as soon as I got there, I was like, I, this is probably not the, I've known Cyrus my whole life. Yeah. So I knew so many people there. I was like, I'm going to go. And then I was like, I'm still better on this side of the ball. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but once I was there, you know, I, I, I did it and I enjoyed every minute of the people I got to work with and learn from. And I was exposed to so much stuff that I just never had visibility to from this side of the ecosystem. But there are people that I could count that had major influences on me. Right. Who are some of them for you? Well, I, yeah, I'll finish the point I was going to say. I don't, I don't know if I hit the punchline on it, which was, oh, uh, which was Blake McLean. Uh, okay. So, so Blake. Blake to me, uh, when I looked at him, you know, a, you guys just, out of this world smart, 
not formally educated. I've met uh, him. I don't think you remember me, but yeah, I've met him a few times. Yeah, not, not, I don't think, uh, I, 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 you know, he, he talked about emotional energy and that you, you know, you, you can't underestimate that. So I learned a lot from him uh, and just how he thought about business and the strategic side of things and, mm-hmm. to, and to not be so robotic about how you go about your day that you got to think about with purpose and think about what you're doing and be strategic about your approach learned a lot from yeah, that and staying focused mm-hmm. on on the end goal i mean i think from blake that was the most meaningful no kidding you yeah. know you guys both had blake like, blake yeah, had a we, huge impact on that company huge, yeah, yeah. Yeah. huge. Uh, look yeah. i mean um the other one to round out cyrus and i, I got one other one that that uh somebody who, who i really uh, take just taking a shine to watching haven't got to spend as much time maybe as i wanted to with but dave Furbin, um going back to cyrus just a team builder. I mean, I think Dave's Dave's a super smart guy too, like Blake. But I I think people wanted to work for Dave, and they wanted to almost like make him proud. You know, very like, unassuming I mean, humble guy. Just just yeah, for a guy that's been that successful and that's done that. No he, kidding. He's he's uh, he doesn't um, he's he's a he's a sharp guy. He's an a, a, a aggressive guy, but he's not a guy that makes other people feel small. You know, and some people that get to that position, they just uh, you know. Uh, arrogance or whatever it might be, they just kind of get dismissive. I've never seen Dave act like that, and I've never seen him behave that way. The other guy that um, maybe you got to know him, or if not, see if he can carve out an hour or two for, for this, is uh, Raul Martinek. Data Bank. Yeah, oh, okay. he's the CEO at Data Bank. Oh, Raul. Bank. I'm sorry. Yeah, Raul. Uh, just watching Raul. When I first had, I first met him uh, at Channel Expo that's going on now, uh, I think he'd still own the company he sold up in the Northeast before he got on with Digital Colony and came over, and I was like, I was like, man, the energy this guy's got is unreal. And I mean, just, maybe we should have him talk at DCAC. Yeah, no, I think I think Raul would be a great guy. And you look at Data Bank and the story. I mean, Data Bank was, to me, a um, you know a company that I you know as as thinking about it like as an analyst, I'm like, I don't know, man. There's a question mark here. You're kind of embedded with other company. I don't know how this model is going to work. But Raul must have seen something came in from Digital Colony. They acquired it, and now you know where they are now. I mean, it's tremendous. So let um, me tell you. Yeah. Um, data bank, we, there would be no overwatch probably without them too. Right just on. Just because, uh, yeah. well, like we could all say that. I mean, our clients are our board. They could right. fire us any day by simply never spending another dollar with us. So we have to perform. And, and that's probably one of the most authentic and organic relationships that are most natural that you could have is yeah. one in which, you know, it's very clearly defined what the intent is for me and them and what the expectations are. You know, I was just thinking about like the customers that have been so influential mm-hmm. in in a career because when you're, you know, when when you're just starting as a company that doesn't have the credibility from a Cyrus One standpoint at the time, right? And and you're asking customers to take a risk on you and you build these relationships. Yeah. I, I can I can name I mean Joel Patterson from Schlumber J was an you know Demetria Stella right like an early early believer in Cyrus One that literally put their jobs on the line on this company that was doing something that's a special person the yeah, customers want to do that Yanni, and not hold I a mean, gun to your head yeah right? the, the CIO of Oxy I mean and, and all of these are friendships that you keep regardless mm-hmm. I mean even after leaving Cyrus One. I keep all of these friendships and relationships. Yeah, 100%. Like, I actually got to work in my uh, last uh, job. That trauma or that stress and inoculation they went through in those programs is yeah. what develops growth in those relationships. Absolutely. Pressure and, testing. And, and it just carries forward, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, there's so many influential and meaningful relationships that you get to build. But it's also important in any career, successful career, is to have a worthy opponent right yeah you had a, a rival. worthy com- competitor <laughs> you and at cyrus one i felt that this was caroline for me she oh, yeah. drove you two the two and tops. motivated me right plus she's pretty savage too right super and uh <laughs> she's and so savage right one one year you know she was at the top the next year i was at the top like yeah. there's just constant and that is incredible when you have that type uh, of relationship. you need a healthy rivalry yeah 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 you need and healthy so, friction I mean, at every business i mean you got to have someone and you competing can't for that minimize position. the importance of that in a su- successful career, you need a worthy opponent, right? And so for me, I mean, Good I also you think guys. that. You know, it's kind of like snow skiing. I don't know if you like skiing or snowboarding. But, yeah. um, I'm a skier. As I get older, I keep thinking, okay, my next trip, I'm, I'm going to have to take it easier. I won't be as good. But I tend to get to ski with people that are really good. And when you watch them ski and kind of mimic what they're doing, you just, you get better. You learn through immersion. Versus if yeah, you're the best, if you're the best, 
at whatever level you are and you're doing it, you're not getting that that peer review, if you will, that peer competition. And uh, and no, I agree with that. No. Pressure yeah. testing each other. So, you yeah. want to be around people that hold a high standard. Yeah. Right? They don't and, allow you to be complacent, right? Mm-hmm. Like you're just like the minute you think you got a big deal and you can relax, you're seeing that they're about to close one and you're like, all right, it's on, let's go. This was a huge side benefit of bringing her out of retirement was I need somebody to keep me sure. on, the, on the right track. Well, the right? two of so, you both will probably be able to pressure test each other quite a bit, yeah. I'm sure. But um, so Blake was a big... Uh, impact for both of you. That's great. I mean, um, what's he doing now? Do you know? Him? Yeah, he's he's obviously retired. Yeah, yeah. He's enjoying the Doesn't retirement life. Yeah, he's in Mexico yeah. a lot, by the way. Yeah. Well, obviously he uh, he had a huge impact on creating what was yeah. you know the one of the largest yeah. data center providers in the world still is right. So and I actually uh, followed you know Blake at my next job at EMC. Mm-hmm. We worked oh, together. Yeah, and so and I've worked with Dave Ferdman at the next company, uh, oh. Cybraics. And so it's keeping up with these relationships to me was super meaningful, right? I mean, although I wasn't at Cyrus One, I was you still have a around lot of the Cyrus IP One people in yeah. this industry, don't you think? Like. People may not remember what logo you had on your shirt, but they'll definitely remember you. Right. They'll right. remember how you made them feel, at least. Right. Maybe not what you said to them. But right. they, you have to, like, the best advice I got in this industry um, was early in my industry um, career where I just happened to be at a conference and someone, they're like, just be careful the toes you step on today because they're connected. They ask you kissing tomorrow, right? And there's so much of that. Absolutely. Well, so Absolutely. when we, when, you know, I, I, I think that's a value we bring to people because I, I, I like also looking at investment in the space for people that want to break into the space from an investment standpoint, right? And when you think about real estate, um, I mean, how many trillions of dollars of real estate are there in the world, right? Just even on the commercial side, but that's a big market, right? So, you know, you, you can kind of make a living just jumping around and just doing deals and handling people however you want, but you can't do that in this industry. It's a much smaller pond. I mean, you know, it's it's – like this, this cup and versus the room, if you will, if you think about the data center industry. So yeah, it is about people and it is about, you know, reputation and it's about, um, getting things done. You, you know, you start, you make a reputation of burning people. Um, that gets around really quick. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't take long. Yeah. yeah <laughs> it doesn't yeah. take long in this industry to find yeah. out who's not doing well. Right. Let, let me shift gears into a couple more things. Cause I want to talk about the data center joint task force. Yeah. We, yeah. Yeah. We've Let's had this conversation that. for yes, a little sir. bit. Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Next week, I'll have some guests that are going to be on because think about what you do and then think about what I do. And I'm kind of on the opposite side, right? So if let's say you want to trivialize it to where there's five phases of the life cycle, right? That starts with really your dojo, right? There's, there are a lot of very talented, um, extremely knowledgeable professionals in the space that come from very hybrid backgrounds, maybe an operator, or maybe they, another part of the ecosystem, Regardless, or maybe they're from, you know, the enterprise. They spend a mm-hmm. lot of time, you know, working on behalf of those people because the way that they view the industry is different than the operator, which is different than finance or us on the ecosystem. If you look at that, there's um, a lot of, I don't, I used to like jokingly call them all lone wolves, right? But you have people that could step out on their own and because they have their own professional IP, they could almost start a practice around themselves. Hey, I have credibility for X, Y, and Z. Um, that's enough to give me a pocket client or an anchor tenant sort of you know solution and now i'm off to the races i i'm i have a client that pays the bills and i could build a practice around that right and that's kind of maybe how a lot of us all started but i found that there's a need of a collective right because um you can't be one dimensional anymore like uh you can't also be all things to all people you can't be viewed as like a lot, I see this challenge a lot in the automotive industry where you have a car company that can make a car and they are very well known for that classic car, that type of vehicle, and then they want to be in the game too, so they introduce something that goes against another class that they don't really have any credibility. I mean, we don't even see them as that. If Honda came out and was going to make a high-performance sports car to compete against Lamborghini and Ferrari, however you just thought when I said that out loud is probably how some people feel about how yeah, I can do that too. I can do that too. No, you can't. Just because you build cars and you make great cars doesn't mean you can make one that can compete at that level, right? I'm not saying they can't do it under another brand, but you got to be really careful because um, the world will see you for the value that you could bring sometimes. And if you try to outgrow that, we can see that. Right. Do you agree? Yeah. Totally. So to that end, there's people that are involved in the design and requirement and development phases right. of strategy. And those are typically people that have a greater advantage if they have access to intelligence and the ability to execute off strategy, right? And then you have people that are really design 
experts, MEP, a &E shops that are, that is the part where in our space, it's biggie little A, and not that we're commoditizing the engineering, but when you have a guy like John Hatem and Cyrus One who's armed right. to the teeth, he knows exactly what his product is. He doesn't really need an engineer to design right. that. They just need a stamp, right? Uh -huh. So they know the product and they're on the they're reading the tea leaves and analyzing and interpreting what's happening in real time based on the the purchase touches that they're getting, right? So they know where the industry's going. <coughs> so you have people that are really focused on the development requirement side, people that are focused on the A and E side. Then then someone's got to build that. Right. Mm -hmm. So someone has the design requirements mm -hmm. and this is what you need. Someone designs to that requirement. Someone builds to that requirement. Then you need someone to commission against that to validate that one, it was designed right. And two, it was built paid the way it was designed so that we could give it over to an operator so they could operate it. And that's the fifth phase, right? Those operators have to take these buildings that they sometimes don't have any input on and they have to figure out how to make them work. Right. And those are, and with a big broad stroke, how we've trivialized the five phases of the data center lifecycle. The data center joint task force is because like for me, I got into the industry. Um, I mean, I didn't really build a company when I left Aligned. I just kind of started building a team and then the company, the capabilities and limitations of that company came around the limitations of the team. Some like if you have a third partner or something, the disruptive capability that, that person have that may be a blind spot to you and you is now an extension of what you could offer as a business. So you know, you kind of swell in the ground, swell a little bit and be like, hey, we could do that. And I started learning, like, I'm an expert on upstream of the PDU as well as down, right? So all the delivery fit out. Like, data center delivery is where I'd like to feel most comfortable. I know the ecosystem. I know all the people that make the, quit, the equipment, and I know all the labor forces. So that's where I really felt strong. I didn't have access to the designs, and I was definitely wasn't getting into commissions because those are so nuanced, right? That, yeah. But now you're seeing a consolidation, you know, and you're seeing, uh, we see it at the bigger level, right? We see it at the wholesale level. You're big is eating small all day long. And, and that consolidation will transcend all the way down into what I work in, which is all service-based, right? right? So when you look in the services, I had asked myself, do I want to go acquire a business that does what you do? Do I want to acquire a design shop or a commissioning shop? Or do I want to go compete against other operators that are doing data center operations? And you know, 90 cents for every dollar spent in this space is supposedly on the CapEx side. I'd yeah. rather stay on the CapEx side. The risk on the OpEx side is tough. I'd have to find a really strong quarterback to come over to run that for me. But each one of those has a business unit president. And and right now I only touch two. I mean, I technically touch operations through staff. I do staff augmentation, but on the recruiting, I do a lot of military recruiting and we place them with, like I said, there would be no us without a Vantage or a data bank or these groups that are hiring so many, yeah. they're, People just like me coming out of the military that didn't haven't seen the ball since kickoff don't have any idea what this industry is, but I have hands and I was sent to some schools to learn some things. Mm -hmm. And with those skills and the ability, my emotional range was higher because I was on a submarine. So I was used to dealing with mission critical environments that were measured on my mortality, not based on whether or not I had downtime. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you've not had to tie a rope around your waist and climb behind a panel and work on yeah. life gear, then you don't know how that equates to mission critical when you're in active duty. But a lot of these people are doing it all day long and the, they're dealing with life and death, right? right? And I came out and said, okay, well, look, I can get in and staff operations people, but I can't lead them. Like you're going to have to have a program to where you could hire them and train them, coach them, mentor them, but they at least have the ability to come in early, stay late, volunteer for the hard shit. They could probably pass a drug test and they've probably been to a lot of schools. So they're going to learn this, right? So, I have that, but the, all the other things I don't. So what happens when I have clients we talk to and they're like, hey, I got to go coast to coast. I'm like, well, I need to bring in some friends, right? And that's how we do it. That's how you do it. That's how we do it. Mm -hmm. And we have pockets. In some markets in the Pacific Northwest or maybe someone, if you guys are in Texas, this is maybe your Mecca. This is where everyone in Texas knows you or you know everyone in Texas. May not as well. It, you may have connections in the Pacific Northwest or Northern Virginia, but maybe not as tight as everybody that you know or everybody that knows you in Texas. So how do I create pockets to where I can bring value to clients? Because half of my clients are the operators, the other half are the enterprise end users. Right. So I have to put together and bring together a collective. And, and finally, I put together a data center coalition that's gonna be launched here in a little bit. And that's really focused on the data center ambassadors. And those are for veterans. So imagine I'm connecting you or you with someone who is in San Diego that is in three months from now gonna get out of the military and they just, uh, you open up a WebEx for 10 sailors, soldiers, or airmen, and you tell them about the industry. So they, they even know it exists. You know, right now they're like, I'm going to go back to where I came from and go work at 
whatever yeah. till I find whatever, right? But I need more people to champion. They don't have to be military veterans. They just be veterans of industry that will be willing to like almost big brother, big sister, be like, look, this is why you want to be here. They not only find value in what you do, but they need you, right? right? And that skill transcends. So I'm trying to build a data center coalition and there's going to be a whole bunch of stuff I'm doing in Q3 on that that yeah. we're going to launch. It's really exciting. This one is really about launching the data center joint task force. And that joint task force means that I don't want to just tangentially have this narrative that says you need something. I can't do that, but I have a friend that can. Instead, I want to create a platform that allows us all to sell upstream and downstream, upstream and downstream. And there's a universal brand that we can sell everything on the truck. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, uh, you can go and sell, uh, if you guys are the tip of the spear on phase one, then, then you don't really have a client that just needs that one. Cause once they're done with that, they're like, all right, now I got to go to the design. And they're like, can you quarterback this for us? Maybe hold right. our hand, walk us through this whole process. Yeah. I think very few people would want data center market intelligence that weren't going to act on it in some fashion. Right. Well, it depends. You, you can't it's be not all things, all people. Well, you could use it to disqualify. <laughs> like, I no, mean, I'm saying, yeah. I'm saying there's a reason that you're yeah, doing yeah. that. Yeah. You could decide not to do something. Yeah. I want to be yeah. really great at this and I want to work with people that share my standard. Right. And it's, pra it's not based on what we espouse. It's based on what we tolerate. Right. Yeah. So I'm like, how hard are you going to work to satisfy your clients? And if you match that for us and you have the ability to do what I can't, then why would I go try to do that when that's right. what you do? Why don't I just try to package that and make that something of a solution so they still have one throat to choke as an easy button? So I started talking to groups, hungry ones that are willing to reinvent themselves and lean in. Some are just, you know, they have annuity model-based clients and they're not looking for more. They're just looking for stabilization. And for me, I'm like, I want to be disruptive and still drive change. So... Why can't I put a joint task force together that says it's shared marketing propaganda that has everybody's logos? It's all transparent, but now people are buying one one thing, soup to you know, beginning to end, and it's not one company that's doing it mm -hmm. all. Right now, you have one company that'll be like, I have four lines of business within this, and we have this tomb that does it, and like that never kind of really works, right? But if I could find someone that like you, you share my passion for what you do. I have my passion, so our energy is equal, and your capabilities for what you do is, I mean, I can't do what you do, but I know that I can do what I do as good as it you can do for you do. Yeah, so absolutely. why wouldn't I find mutual partners who are making yeah. a creative for all of us to kind of, and we need to have a depth chart. We need a couple, and, and what happens when you've hit the bandwidth that you can't take on more? Well, we don't want that machine to stop pumping. Uh -huh. We can't, we got to keep the prime pump, right? So there's going to be things. You're going to always have more than your fair share of the opportunities. But if we could create an ecosystem, a data I'm center task that. force, yeah. that I can plug in people to where I can literally sell that like a white glove. It's still on my paper. It's on your paper. It doesn't matter. Either way, the client gets the value and we are all still working together with one shared purpose. So I'm trying to create that and it's hard because you have to kind of like build that and then hope that it creates the orbit around it to mm -hmm. where I could draw in those people that have that appetite to join something that could have a greater impact, right? So we started talking about that months ago with you, mm -hmm. right? And there's about nine groups between all five phases. I mean, there's groups that are in our phase that I had to go talk to and be like, look, um, MCIS, you're exceptional at everything from the tenant fit outside. We do a lot of tenant fit out. Why don't we just partner on more of that? Well, you know? and this is sort of how I've informally operated uh, for It's informal. I want to make it formal. I want to yeah, make this I'm the way you. that we yeah. do it. Because, because they're going to have too many. Our industry is going to be in an existential threat of labor because the silver tsunami of all the people that have been in the industry for more than 20 years are going to start retiring. Well, And there's okay. a huge gap. Let me tell you something we might want to brush off. Um, maybe not us three necessarily uh, driving it individually, but um, – you know, I've been involved in uh, industry training programs. Um, uh, so going back to Sean Tario, uh, do you know Sean, by the way? If you don't, I'll make an introduction. If I don't, I'd love to. Yeah. So he was in Silicon Valley. He and I met. What's his at, last name? Uh, Tario. Okay. So we met in 2000, like shortly after I kind of kicked off independent initiatives, I met him in at the Infomart back in 2014-15. And I was with Kevin Knight. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, digital guy. Yeah, he was with Digital Equine Action, an industry veteran guy. Um, he used to live here, I think. Right? Yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah, he's uh, actually we caught up last week. Um, Kevin's a great guy. So he's so, still in the game. Uh, on and off a little bit. You know, he's uh, a few years ahead of us, and you know, enjoying fruits of his labor. And and That's uh, how it works. But yeah, so we were actually at a training program, and um, 
you know, one of the reasons that I started doing, you know, the independent type work that I was doing to begin with was being at SARS and seeing things that were so emerging, just the knowledge gap of, of people procuring things that they really didn't fully understand, right? And it, which still exists. And and also, you know, where you can kind of see we had pretty good training programs at Cyrus One, um, pretty with some pretty cool strategic types. A things. lot of value in that. A lot, lot of value, value in, that. in that. So this is it with uh, governance on yeah, those. Yeah. So Sean, are huge. Uh, and he still has this. He has the material. There's books. There's materials, and we would go in and do one or two day training programs, and we use it in different uh, models. But um, I mean, a lot of the data center companies would send their salespeople to it, and it was really fun and really. I cool. mean, less DCD, IDCA. Uh -huh. I mean, there's a lot yeah. of those groups, and I need more of that, right? Because yeah. I'm also standing yeah. up a DoD Skillbridge program that allows me. I have to kind of create curriculum design for this one industry. So I think it's. I think it'd be good to visit that. So we yeah. can visit that. And I'll make an introduction. He's focused on starting some other initiatives right now, but we could brush some of that off. huge right now, and uh, and I, I think you're right because I mean it even goes back to where you look at some of the emerging markets that we're in. Um, you know, maybe maybe what we could do is um, formalize uh, some sort of education initiative. And, uh, you know, maybe we take turns of playing professor and doing some of that. But I think I think it, um, you know, it's 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 really fun really to see that because you go in and sometimes you get in there and you're maybe with, you're with smart people, really smart people. But you, we take for granted some of the experience and knowledge that we have. And you're trying to talk somebody through how to how to quantify what the cost of power would be and, you know, how those numbers play out, stuff that we can do on a napkin like this. And uh, you start showing people that and you start getting to understand business models and different structures and how economics in this space works. That drives so much. And uh, look, not everybody's going to get that. And you go back to passion and uh, people can kind of learn what they like and what aptitude. But getting – you don't learn this stuff at many universities, right? Well, <laughs> so. I, I was just going to say Perfect. if you build a curriculum, yeah. right, in, in what angle you want to explore further or build towards – Listen, I, I've done, I mean, in cybersecurity, it's also another area with huge gaps in talent. Oh, and, yeah. and so I worked, you know, with a lot of the local universities in building programs to be able to have or first gain interest within the, the, the college communities, right, to be able to further train in these specific areas. And then, you know, from an industry standpoint, there was always some kind of industry executive mm -hmm. involvement to, to be able to, one, get them excited about it. Many of the careers today, students that are applying to college don't know about. They don't know that these are options. Well, there's so, no real – there's only a few yeah. schools that even have degrees that are listed or anything around data centers. I, I'll say this. I, I'm with you, and I think that that is better than nothing, right? But I'll also say this. I just um, – I don't think that we need to invest – okay, this is like uh, – but, well, but that that's from the technical side, right? There are so many other components to the data That's what I'm saying industry. is like some things are static. And that's why the curriculum – The way that right. you deliver like electrons and right, things. Right, but right, right. The physics side, they do, they do have that in college. But when you start getting to the business side and the right. rationale that's why and like, the emergency side – Why bother training someone? Yeah. Why, like, wh there's no reason to have a college degree for this because if you started right now, your daughter's starting UT, if they you got into data centers and that was – by the time that she graduates, whatever she learned is obsolete, right? right? So, like, right. why? I feel like there needs Hold to be on. more immersion. Other than the fundamentals, you got to understand Certain the fundamentals. business understanding of this, right? Yeah, I guess you're right. And in and some, some of these things, these fundamentals, they going back to, for example, like even um, even just from a business perspective and how to apply it, you know, like. But the way that people make yeah. purchasing decisions, think about you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's night and day different, yeah. right? You like the type of person that you had to be to be in sales in those days to be successful like you had to be extremely technical and you had to go head to head against competitors and the you know build technical model. financial plus you know yeah, you had yeah. brokers that sometimes things, yeah. were walking these deals in that they were like very mm -hmm. objective and saying i'm gonna go try to they weren't trying to let anybody have an advantage right so there was so many different things it's different today and my thing is fundamental same but there are some things that are just wildly different that you just have to be doing. You have to roll up your sleeves and you have to get your hands dirty and you've got to be immersed and you have to learn. And there's only so much you can learn by sitting behind, you know, in a classroom behind a book in this space, in my opinion, right? And I think it's just learning. We need more mentors. We need more people that are creating incubator programs. Yeah. And, and that's what I'm trying to do. The Data Center Joint Task Force will also allow me to 
I mean, there's customers here in Austin that have data center projects that I'm like, hey, can I, uh, at no cost to you, can mm -hmm. I put three people on this for the next four months uh, to, to learn this thing? No cost to you. You get a staff augmentation. Right. I just need them to have experience. Yeah, right? hands-on experience. Because Uncle Sam's thing. paying for them. They're in the DOD yeah. SkillBridge program. Yeah. They get six months of being paid by Uncle Sam learning that apprenticeship. But now when they're done, now they have some experience. They at least know the language. Yeah. They know what you're talking about when right. you're talking about, like, if you, it, I don't know how long it took me to understand how to list every component from the electrical fermentation from the substation down, but that was one of the first things I started on when I got into it. I'm like, I need to understand how we deliver power. Now, that's right. hugely valuable because it's always that catch-22, right? I mean, you're looking for experience, but how do you get experience if you don't give me an opportunity? You get what I'm right? saying? Yeah. But yeah. doing it but, real, being yeah. learned. I mean, yeah. you, how much did... There was no classroom. Listen, you guys no, seemed no, to no, just like, fine. There was no, no classroom, and no, you guys we, had leaders and mentors. No, well, actually, I well, think that's right. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, but no, but hold on. One of the boot things. Yeah, the yeah. boot camps were pretty cool. We you went through those. one, didn't you? So listen, I went through like a hybrid version of one. Oh, okay. Oh I, gosh, I don't yeah. think... I thought he was not a big fan of Kirk Fell, I don't think. I don't yeah. think a lot of people were. So I, I had the hybrid version of it. You remember I showed up. I didn't you guys get it. All I didn't laughed. get it at first. She was not happy. Yeah. You know, and uh, I was. That's stepchild. right. We were. We, you, you came know, on just as we were. You know, it's funny. I, I just saw Dottie last week. And yeah. the first she thing doing? she. How's she doing? Is she going? She's wonderful. Give her my best. Yes, I yeah. will. And the first thing she tells me in the parking lot, she's like, look. As I was driving here, I was remembering the time that when I j first joined my very first boot camp, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it was Cyrus One's first boot camp ever. I was a little nervous. I was in my early 20s. I didn't know what was going on here, right? And I'm so we're doing this role play, and I'm supposed to introduce Dan Vasquez, who was our most technical, very influential in helping us out here. Absolutely. Like, he helped me significantly. Um, and I'm supposed to introduce him, and I couldn't think of what was the title that I'm supposed to introduce him as, so I called him my assistant. Right? Ah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. it was just one of those, you're put on the spot. I and love it. Just awesome. like, uh, I love it. And, and I'm we're talking that. like 18. 20 years and that's what you Donnie remembers him as his yeah. <laughs> he would hate it when he hears this <laughs> but yeah you're right I mean like there was that but prior to that there's not a we learn from survival we learn based on their immersion and I think maybe it was you that was talking about it but when you surround yourself with savages, it turns out you become well, more savage, right? right? Goes, if you want to be great, to be around the greatest. It goes yeah. back to mentor. The funny thing was, and, and Cyrus won for his, his um, stronger culture and kind of almost cultish and how much we yeah, had on each other. awesome. Back. I love You that. had to get into it to be into it. And, uh, I mean, three I weeks in, they me. almost kicked me out because I didn't know a damn thing. I didn't know anything. <laughs> I didn't know the language. I knew nothing. And uh, Dottie's like, eh, you know, you're not really asking the right questions. And I was like, you know, I don't know shit, right? <laughs> Shades and, and like patience. I remember that. And so, yeah. so she was like, well, I don't know if this is going to work. I was like, mm, did she ever yell? Did she ever get mad? Oh, Dottie? Yeah. Does that lady she, get mad? She I get fired up. Yeah. I never saw she, that lady. She's she never but she yelled get at me. Fired up. Yeah. But so the bottom line was, we're talking about Danny V. I got to give huge credit to Danny V. Um, as soon as that meeting left, which didn't go well, I'm there for a few weeks and nobody trained me because I was a one-off hire. And uh, I didn't have any boot camp. I had no training. And so... I went into Dan's office. I was like, hey, man, I'll, uh, we need to go have some beers on me. And so I was like, dude, I don't know what the language is. Can yeah, you help coach me? Easy. And, but he was, he was a mentor to me for that. And I knew that once I would get it, I would get it. But it is, you're right. To your point, we need yeah. people. Like, you know, it, it's mentors. willing to teach it. It's, that's the coalition. It's kind of yeah. like teach pay it forward, forward, pay hey, listen, it back. Listen, this is coalition. And, you yeah. know, no one block and tackled for, like, listen, I was an idiot. I still am, right? But, I mean, I was even a bigger idiot than blind man walking through this industry with a cane, yeah. not knowing what I was bumping into in a maze, right? Yeah. And luckily, there were just people that were like, hey, man, you got to go this direction. And I don't. I, uh, I can't begin to explain the number of people that have helped me just, mm -hmm. I mean, even now I'll say stupid yeah. things on this podcast and someone will text me like, stop saying that. And I'm like, <laughs> thank God they like me enough to tell me. That no, I, that's true. You got to have people to tell you these, you got to have yeah. people that are going to talk to you and you got to be willing to take that shit. Right. right. So what, well, let me do this. Cause I do want to bring this podcast home. I know you guys got to get back to Houston, but like, what is, what is the one thing you want? If people hear this, what do you want them to know about you guys and how do they get in touch with you? What can you help them with? I mean, that's kind of broad strokes I painted with. Obviously, you're there on the all the requirements side, mm -hmm. all the strategy side, and the execution side. But really, does that begin and end on all aspects of the data center? Is it really only focused on the development phase? Is it? I mean, it does talk about the data center joint task force where you could probably mm -hmm. reach into design and commissioning and things like that through partners. But like, what do you want them to really know if they got done and they only heard this one part? Well, so let me let me lead yeah. off. Oh, I want to so, hear from both of you. Though. I, I want to hear. Because... We're going to hear from both, but but I want to lead off by just saying like. 
what I have found is that people often, because maybe they have some limited experience or something, they kind of overestimate or oversimplify things, and they they walk into traps, whether it's investors, sometimes operators because they're closed off to the community, or or you're you're an end user, and oh, you know, so and so did a data center project, and so they're overconfident, right? I can tell you this. When I go review status quo, what what existed, whether it's something in-house, your in-house things, or the mix of things that you have, I usually find pretty significant inefficiencies in across the board, right? Um, you know, and I look normal at normal human nature. Yeah, it's normal stuff. Yeah, it's inefficiencies, phase, right? Yeah. I mean, in, in most things, like from from even you know good sized multi billion dollar enterprises. Um, they tend to self-represent what they're doing a lot of times. And, you know, there is a lot of fear and, and uncertainty and doubt that, that is existing in IT environments and things like that. So I would say from our standpoint is that, you know, we have experience um, by nature, make it easy to work with us, but it's got to match. We don't, we're not transactional. We don't come at it and say, oh, I'm selling you this, right? I don't know what to sell you. I don't, I don't know what you need. Really, all, all I would really try to sell is to say, you know, an engagement of a discussion and exploration of seeing if we can offer you value, okay? And then because, you know, we don't work typically with like a startup, right? So you're already doing something. You already started your journey, whether whatever that may be. And if you're a complex multinational organization, which is normal for us, um, there's a lot of moving pieces to that. And um, we don't really replace what people have in most cases. We're not it, – it's, it's an augmentation, it, it, it's it's a it's a co-pilot, you know, to be used, and so that's what I want people to understand about us. And and outside of that, we hammered it pretty good early, which is we got a real passion for doing impactful projects, right? So things that matter, things that are meaningful, and uh, moving the ball forward um, in in different aspects and areas of this industry um, doesn't really matter what the vertical is per se, um, you know. So I feel like you know that hopefully that. It's no, it's good. Enough. I mean, there's no yeah. wrong answer. It's it's whatever. Let your love light shine. Never. You're like, hey man, what are we gonna talk about? I'm like, just let your love light shine. Yeah. Don't, don't overthink these things. We just want to have a conversation. It just so happens. I mean, it is just us three sitting here. We could remove yeah. any piece we don't want, and it's just we're doing this selflessly so that we can share mm -hmm. what. Trust me, there are people that are trapped inside their own heads, and they're like, "What am I doing? Am I on?" And they're gonna hear from you and be like, "Hey, maybe I'm on the right track," you know. So, yeah. what about you? No, listen. For for me, what I enjoy the most about being currently in this phase, right, and with sort of the extended experience throughout the technology sector, is the ability to take one go deep into the business aspect of a plan, whether it's to go into a new market, what is the strategy behind it, get all the financial, the data points that back up that strategy, right? But then helping you execute that strategy. There is no, rarely will there be a shortage of great ideas. There's always good ideas. How to execute on those ideas and blend in the technology factor of it, but also not losing sight of the importance of what is the, 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 the whole approach? What is the value of what we're doing? What's the commercial aspect of it? What are the variables in the commercial aspect of it? And executing against that, that to me is the exciting part, right? And so for us to be able to combine it with the common denominator of data centers, right? So it, because what I said is it can be very broad, but if you bring it to that common denominator of data centers and data center strategies and building and operating and executing and growing the data center industry, then it kind of ties it together. And I think for me, if I can take that and, and what the value or, or sort of where I enjoy the most is piecing that greater approach of why we're doing validating and then being part of all of the other things that come with that data center approach. So when people think about, all right, what are what 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 can I leverage that stuff for? Or what is she doing? I think it's just helping bring all of these pieces together to the greater outcome. What is the goal that we're trying to achieve? Validating that goal and putting a plan together to execute against the goal. I think um, there was a consultant that I had on here once. I forget which one it is, so I don't want to miscredit one. But really, there was um, they codified it in a really simple term. They're like. There are things that you're going to do in your life. You know, it could be from a surgery to, you know, buying and selling a car or a home, you know, things that just you don't do very often, unless that's what you do professionally. But when those things happen, you know, everyone wants a consultant. They want a validator, a subject matter expert. They want right. a professional to guide them and, and give them confidence that what they're doing as they're going through what could potentially be one of the most dangerous or complicated or financially risky times of their life 
they want someone there in their corner mm -hmm. that knows more than them and they can help validate where they want to go and understand you know how to protect them from themselves and that's almost the best way to describe what consultants do in this space mm -hmm. right because he's like the more complicated the program where it just has too many variables maybe there's something going on where there's you know the state the government the county has self-imposed some things plus you have pressure from external third parties from supply chain to labor to and they just would go down they're like we, you normally want to bring us in and, and what we don't have we have the ability to go draw into the industry and and pull out right right and i think that that's the thing i mean i found that most consultants that are really you know they could some people try to go a, a mile wide and a half inch deep and and that's great because you need some introduction but at the end of the day i i want a brain surgeon not a doctor working on my brain you know so like when that happens people need to know how to message it, create a narrative that allows them to understand like just categorize whatever it is into something that's massively complicated and then i need a subject matter expert for that that's it right so you yeah. have to find that way to well, i'll tell you one of the things i've enjoyed most for years um in 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 doing consulting work is actually working with attorneys um you know where attorneys may be highly skilled at what they do but understanding the subject matter right yeah and how to apply that to the risk associated with how they need to be thinking about it and that's one of the things i enjoy most about working in user projects because i really feel like i'm offering even though Almost exclusively, I'm working on the buyer side, right? So our team's representing, you know, here, here's your here's your very simple letter. I'm representing this client, mm -hmm. and I am a buyer's representation. So it's a representative. So it's 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 making it very clear that hmm. you start telling me things, I'm telling my client because you're basically talking to the client. Yeah. Okay. So working with attorneys is a lot of fun because we've been through this, right? where attorneys are screwing deals up, not because they're trying to screw deals up. They're looking after the interests of their client. But if there's no representation that's got deep experience in the subject matter, they may be red flagging something that makes no sense to red flag. Um, so that's where I'll walk through a lot of things. And a lot of times where people don't even understand risk, going now to where we are skipping forward in this hyperscale world, I take I, when I look at a, a provider that's focused almost exclusively on hyperscale, that's that I feel good about the risk associated with say default or things like that, but I get worried about being a smaller fish in a big pond because uh, you know, as you've probably seen, when you're dealing with the big kids, the big cloud guys, uh, they're getting their way on a lot of things. If they it, you jump, you got to say hi, and sometimes I think that's why people just focus on that because managing now thirty other clients on that campus could be a conflict. It could cause a problem, right? So trying to explain to people how mm. to protect your interests, right, from clauses and contracts, for example, like you can be moved for a reasonable whatever the language kind of mean. Like, let's talk that through, guys. How do we protect ourselves? How do we vet this out of whether it's a risk or not? Things like that. It's just one example. But that's the stuff that I've really in enjoyed because we've seen, we've seen this. And, and now we're starting to see in the industry – and we're gonna. I think we'll see more of it where, you know, the good and the bad get separated. You know, I think. I think you know. I'll. It's all public, but the Sun Guard situation. A lot of people got hurt by that, or or are in the process of being hurt by that. Um, the last thing you want is to be a tenant, for example, in a data center property where your provider has gone belly up. I can't believe that. Or is in the process yeah. of going belly up. The disruption could be catastrophic. So how do you defend yourself? How do you understand that? Because it's not like buying pencils, okay? You, when you're getting into critical vendor relationships, and, that, and that, that's the other thing that I've talked about is like, hey, this is, this is the most leverage you'll ever have in the relationship before, before you integrate before your you critical yeah. assets onto a property and you are no longer your own landlord, right? Because there, there's the pros and the cons and the goods and the bads to all this. Who are you dealing with? And not just who are you dealing with today and what they say. Ten years from now, who will own this company and who will be your landlord could be very different. So yeah. let's think through this process. Let's understand it. Those are the things that so I So basically love. navigating through the legal terminology and the business impact is yeah, what you're doing. Navigating through that and being able to seriously uh, um, whiteboard and strategically play that out, those are fun sessions to get involved in. I mean, and, and I feel I feel excited about the value that we offer when we do that. Um 
Because it, it, you know, I tell people this. That's it makes experience no that sense. matters. It That's experience no that matters. Absolutely. Even if you're a top ten bank, you wouldn't want to pay. You would. You wouldn't want to sitting in an office all day, doing what we do. You, we are. A, you know, we we operate. Even though we can do it for a broad range of audiences and a broad range of projects, our specialties are pretty. No, there's know, a lot of demand for is, people that have uh, the yeah. knowledge that you you two right. have. So it's just hopefully even those that listen to the podcast that have the opportunity to discover that you're even out there, that maybe you haven't had the opportunity to reach them yet. It's only so many hours in a day, whatever it is. Yeah. But, mm-hmm. um, the goal is to try to feed the ecosystem, try to figure out how we can help create force multipliers for each other to give you the opportunity to have a seat at the table that you otherwise may not have because um, we just happen to be the right place at the right time, talk to someone, they have a need for something I don't do. I have people that I could be like, well, it depends. Um, Oh, well, I do know a person that could do that. And right mm-hmm. now, you know, it's not like, I think we've all been doing that. We've been good soldiers. We've been helping each other. I, yeah. I'm farming people all the time, but the, the reality it's is- been, But I, it's been informal. Yeah. If I could create a data center joint task force mm-hmm. that um, is more financially accretive for everybody and it makes it easier to where um, you're measuring, you don't have to spend so much time investing into an opportunity. One of us will qualify on behalf of the other one. So that yeah. when one of us is engaged, we're like, okay, guys, this is the real deal. It's met these metrics that we've all agreed on. Um, wh- which one of us is going to play quarterback? Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Is it let, which phase is it in? Because maybe it's in your phase and then you, get, we all work for mm-hmm. you type of thing. But then when it gets passed over to, then I'm, does that make sense? And we need to have this program. Better structured a team. Our industry is going to scale and it needs to be right now. Revenue sharing. Revenue sharing. Yeah. yeah, Revenue sharing is look. um, Most real estate people that are involved in the data center industry were real estate people that got involved in the data center industry. So I'm, I'm a real estate. I I backed into real estate, if you will. So kind of the other way around. Um, uh, the real estate community, right, which is a huge part of data center, right? I mean, real, you know, yeah, for is sure. that the foundation of real estate sort oh, of situation? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, what I have found as being strengths and weaknesses, which they always kind of sing to each other, of the of the real estate industry is strength is entrepreneurialism and the weakness is entrepreneurialism, right? Because it's a lack of structure, and you find a lot of, especially on the commercial side, the larger you go up the food chain, I mean, you might have somebody that you know, they hadn't, they hadn't had a project close in quite a while and the, the, the cupboard's getting dry and, and it tends to lead to a lack of sharing. And what I mm. look to do with partners and we've had success with a number of offices at Transwestern is trying to get people to understand, like, there's a start to a process and maybe there's not a huge pot of gold, uh, tomorrow on something like this. But if you, at this point in your career, like you say, learn something that's becoming impactful, it's changing how office, every, all this is changing how office real estate even operates. Um, I find that the willing parties, they really start embracing that and they start being open to sharing. But I think that's often the problem is that being able to to jump into something you're not 100% comfortable with, it's not something that you have a lot of experience in and you're being asked to take a minority cut, which is necessary. If you're not driving a project, you're probably going to need to take a minority cut on that. But a lot of people in the real estate side or in, in some other facets, they're like, no, I'm taking the majority because it's my client. And it's like, but that's not really how this works, right? And mm. so we have to we have to kind of actually talk through those sort of things. Yeah. That, because if you don't. There'll be a committee that yeah, figures that out. I don't well, have to figure that problem out. Well, who, but no matter how smart I am, whoever joins but that, it's been a barrier. we'll figure it out with But us. I'm yeah. telling you right now, it's been a barrier to a lot of things. It's a it's a barrier to, it's a barrier to a lot of collaboration is how does it the money be. flow and work? No, it I, won't and, be. We'll I'm, make something so transparent I'm confident, that everyone understands. I'm confident that we can, but I'm just saying that's that's what we see. As long as you stay focused on the what the outcome side. is. What's yeah. the goal? The rising what are you tide will lift all boats. Yeah, 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 let's just, yeah. And, I think that there will be something that's very clearly defined, almost like and, in a sales role where like if you don't contribute as much coming in and coming yeah. out, it's really and easy. Everyone it's, knows it's a, it's a collective that gets the outcome, right? This is a collaboration it, it, in every case. It can be worked in, and it's just, it's just kind of getting people – I, the way I think that process has to start is that everybody has to kind of be honest. Like you open it with an honest thing like, okay, and, and everybody has to kind of say to themselves like, hey, for this to work, we got to be flexible. And everybody has to be, you know, sort of open to starting the process and 
we can have a discussion if things are changing along the way. And and that's the people that I've worked best with. I mean, I've worked, I've worked, yeah. I've collaborated with people for ten years that I have no formal contract with. Yeah, yeah. listen, I and get I know it. you have too. So I, I'm cool with that. I just want to yeah. make something that that um, will transcend long beyond when you and I are no longer in the game, right? And I think yeah. Kirk, it's also important for us to like. Are the cus- what's the value to the customer, right? There's clear value mm-hmm. to all of us because you're part of a of a bigger picture collective. and a collective yeah. and you get, you know, you get brought into projects and so forth. But if we can articulate what does that mean to the customer? What problem will we be solving in this collective to the customer? Then the rest just kind of gets falls together because mm-hmm. that tells us what exactly are we what is the outcome that this group is wanting to deliver that's going to solve either a need client? Or, or a, maybe a need that the customer doesn't even know it exi- you know, the a challenge that they may not have yet, right? So, what exactly are we doing that aligns to the customer, the customer needs? And then we can say, all right, this is the role that everyone will play within this group, right? This is how we all get towards that outcome. I was inspired by this model from the healthcare industry, and I'll tell you how. And then we'll shift. Um, like, I was a patient at MD Anderson once. And I remember having, you know, surgeries in between one sitting down and I had a whole, there's like 15 people standing in front of me and they all had MD or, um, and I realized, you know, it's the microvascular surgeon and the orthopedic oncologist and the, you know, there were so many different specialists and fellows and things like that, that I realized that when they came to us, it wasn't like, Hey, let's talk to somebody. And they're like, this is the greatest thing that you need to do because they care about that one part, Mm -hmm. but they didn't really take an effect. Like. What would that, what would the rest yeah. of my life be if I, you know, lost my leg or like, I want to understand how the ripple effect was. And they're like, sorry, I'm the orthopedic right. surgeon or, you know, uh, I'm going to be focused on just this. They don't care about the other, yeah. they don't, and not, and they shouldn't, right? I mean, like you shouldn't care about the means and methods and how I'm going to go find cheaper materials to build things faster. You should care about the requirements of a client and what the development needs are so I can maintain that. So my thing is, is. I learned that these doctors were coming in and they were solving cancer by putting all the experts in a room and saying, all right, let's look at it from all the dimensions. So that way we don't just do one thing that yes, benefits the patient today, but creates a bigger problem for them in a year or two from now. And that's why, right? And I feel like it's the same thing. We're trying to make the programs healthier for these customers. The value to the client would be we're putting all the experts in one room and making sure that what we're doing isn't just solving one problem, but we're making sure that we're not creating a bigger problem in the future. But you said it exactly. It. You start from the out in, right? You don't build something and push it out. You start from the out in. And that's how you build all the components within this group that can align to the purpose, the objective, right? But if you don't start from the out in, then you're going to build something and try to push it to see where it fits. And to your point exactly, right? Like everyone in that room in this hospital knew that you're starting from how do we solve this problem? And yeah. everyone shared and collected it and all came started out with quality the game life. Plan. Like how mm-hmm. do, what you know, it all started from that and they worked backwards based on what my tolerance mm-hmm. was, you know, right. if my hypochondriac am I gonna you know, just I had to do all kinds of psychological things to make sure that I could make these decisions, right? But um let me shift gears because I know we're yeah. running up against the stuff. I could talk to you guys about this type of stuff obviously forever and I've talked to you guys before. I love this industry. I love this game. It's great to see you back in the game. Thank you. What do you, uh, the last question I always like to ask people is because I'm still looking for the, I find that a lot of people struggle to tell people what they do for a living, specifically in this industry. So I'll give you a second to hear his since you just kind of maybe got back in the game within the last year. But mm. when I you, feel like I'm going first too much now. You have Go to. But no, well, what do you tell people better, you do? So, you know, the way I kind of describe it is that I'm, I'm, a, I'm a subject matter expert in in the business of the data center community, right? And that, you know, I can work with those three audiences that we've talked about, whether you're a buyer of services to run your business, uh, whether you are an investor looking to put capital and investment into the marketplace, uh, or whether you're an operating vehicle company, uh, typically backed by one of those investors, um, you know, What's happening in the market and how should you be positioning and changing in, in a market that's – we know is not static. It changes a lot. So that's really how I describe it. That, you know, yeah, that's, that's my domain. high tech part. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and, and the way that I went back because you got to be careful depending on your audience. So you're always like Goldilocksing this thing. It's like you know you don't want to sound too simple to people that are, that are in the know and you don't want to sound too complicated to people that aren't. So 
Yeah, it's kind of like where we played around with There's branding. no silver bullet to this answer. No, nah, we played around we played around with the branding on the the uh, trans western side when, you know, we've been in property acquisitions and representing investors and it's technology properties. That's where we landed on, right? Because when you say data center for example, inside of a real estate community is like, "Oh, my client doesn't own data centers." It's like digital infrastructure. It's yeah. like, "Well, I can guarantee you that they have more than one data center. Yeah. Now, what form that's in, and then the, you, then you lose them. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like it's technology properties, and here's who we represent, and then you can get into that. So I got you. What do you yeah. tell people? Um, I help either build or validate a strategy, right, whether it's going into a new market, whether it's acquiring, selling, specific to data centers. And then I help with the execution of a strategy, whether it's the sales strategy approach in a market, whether it's efficiency and optimization. So from the beginning, entering into a market, how to do it, an investment standpoint, a validation of the approach. And then once you're operating, sales efficiency, market expansion strategy, comparison strategy, expansion strategy in those two areas. It's almost like, uh, and I'm not, I paint with a broad stroke here, so don't, I yeah. don't mean to trivialize, but. There was a there was a void that I felt like, not that the brokers don't fill uh, a need today, but there was a time that they played a completely different role. Would you yeah. agree? Today, there's a lot of enterprise and users that were just very, very. Uh, the easy button was to go to the cloud. We're seeing a lot of repatriation of cloud, and they still don't want to go back on prem, so they're looking for best options. And there's a huge demand for procurement teams today that are not FAMGA or large hyperscale, but there are groups that make purchasing decisions similar to hyperscalers. Yeah. Um, just maybe not as much, but they do in the same volume. And and those are the ones that probably find the most value in what you guys are doing mm-hmm. because someone needs to hold their hand and be that subject matter expert walking them through because they don't know what they don't know and they don't see it long enough. They're just not proficient in that because that's not the line of business they use to generate their own right. revenue. That's the cost center of their business. So they need someone that knows those things. So I can see a ton of value in that. I see that what I'm trying to do is to not have markets that have pocketed sporadic, you know, like, well, it depends on where you're going. If you go to Virginia, there's three people there that used to work for this. And now they're all like, they've got to the point where like, I'm done building everyone else's dream. I'm going to build my own, mm, but they're yeah. doing it with not a lifestyle business, but it has limitations based on what they're trying to grow. And I'm like, how do I harness that? Mm-hmm. How do I harness all these experts? How do I take all these SMEs and figure out a way to o- introduce that from a different perspective to the industry because it, it, collectively, if I do that and I create an environment that allows a greater exchange between these experts, we could effectively drive the average strength of the industry up. Yeah, no, for sure. And and it's not starting, look, uh, we don't feel that the value is best when a customer has a set of requirements and says, help me find X amount of square footage and X amount of power. Helping you build the scope of your requirements, the whys, the financial impacts of that, and then going into and helping identify it, find it, align it, buy it, whatever the case may be. But then when you're an operational looking for ways to become expand, to take a competitive edge, to open a new sector within it, right? All of those things. So to Todd's point, it's not a, it's not a sell it and forget it, right? These are relationships yeah, that we build. For sure. It's I'll, give you, I'll give you a real good example of that. I was involved in a project. Um, not sure exactly when, but not too long ago. And, uh, it was for a bank and, uh, so I got brought in, you know, relationship-wise, um, sitting in front of the CIO and the and the and the project team that for a year had been investigating how they were going to move data centers off of out of bank buildings. They didn't want to they didn't want to have them in the bank buildings, but they'd been you know been working with Gartner, been working with other consultants, and you know running around, flying around, looking at data centers, doing all this kind of stuff. But it was like they didn't have a business case. And I'm asking, I said, you know, have you really rationalized your current expenses? Have you have you looked at the, what your current status in these properties is? Yeah, to justify this. Yeah. Right. And what what this looks like. What, what, are, what are the whole, you know, how are you going to present this to the board? And I was like, yeah, I'm working on this. And I was like, I've been doing this for a little while. And they said, and then they, you know, I could see it was going well. Conversation was going well. And they said, well, just so you know, you know, XYZ Real Estate Company is um, – uh, is interested in representing these transactions. And I said, well, I said, let me explain the difference. I said, I, I, I don't see a re- transactions for me to represent. Um, and I don't look at it that way. Um, I said, 
looks like what you guys need help with is really trying to rationalize to the business about what you should or shouldn't do. And I said, I frankly don't know because you, you don't, you haven't collected enough information to really understand what the business should and shouldn't do. And I said, that's probably the best value. And I would, I would be interested in doing that, but that that's probably going to need to start at least um, more from a traditional consulting standpoint, because you're, you're not ready yeah. to execute you gotta, a transaction. You gotta get your hands dirty, yeah. And I said, look, there's a lot of value that I can, that can come out of this. Um, I can look at all the work that you've already done. I said, but first I'm going to help you make sure you've baselined everything that you've got. And there's a gap between it and operations and facilities a lot to where understanding how to do that analysis, it's just, it's not something, again, you learn in school. You, you, you learn it by doing it and being taught that. And uh, we know how to do that. And so before I, he goes, he goes, yeah, you're hired. Just send me the paperwork. Because he got it. The CIO got it. And we ultimately, within uh, within 60 that. days, within 60 days, we were able to get that project um, board ready. And I, and I did validate that, hey, it's a no-brainer to go this path. Um, and, uh, but here's what that scope looks like. And ultimately, to her point, because we've lived this, getting actually the scope proper and understanding it is so much more important than what's the incremental cost yeah. of the of widget course. that you're buying. Because we see it time and time and time and time again. Uh, we see it forever on the network side. But it can burn you less on the network side because, say, buying a gig versus – buying 10 gigs is not a 10x situation you don't get that same efficiency with the utility constraints that you have on the on the uh on the data center side you have real world costs that you can't burst your way out of like sure. you can on network but a lot of times it people in their conservative approach not understanding contract structures will overbuy for the sake of overbuying with the same mentality which is not necessary there's different ways to align and structure agreements and contracts so i i, I like to look at um, I like to look at it from that standpoint, um, and uh, you know, the structure from that standpoint. You guys have <laughs> so, something really special yeah. going on. I'm really excited for both of you. It's great to see you again. Thanks for finally making that time. To Man, join no, the I really appreciate the invite. Yeah, yeah. yeah I hope to see you guys Enjoy at the, the conference. And yeah. yeah, I mean, hopefully, we're going to be doing some stuff with the data center. No question. Well, right? Hey, uh, definitely want to make it to DCAC, and I definitely want to see you come to Toronto too. We're going to have. I'd a, love to. Let me know when that conference it's is. It's a I'll tremendous come. conference, so you'll enjoy it. I would love okay. to go. We we do some work up there, so I mean, I just need an excuse. So, yeah, yeah. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure to Thank have you. you. Thanks for coming to Austin. No Thanks question. for making the time. Yeah. Good to see awesome you to again. See you again. Yeah, Likewise. Great conversation. Thank you Just for the, the beginning invite. of uh, hopefully in a short amount of time we could get on Absolutely. and do this again and talk about some really cool stuff with regarding Absolutely, the task force. Man. Yeah. Awesome. Safe travels back, guys. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for everything. Yep.